drive. Tatum the finish. It is Baylor 18. The mission commanded. It's mission accomplished. What's up, everyone? This is Noah Dalzell from the You Got Boston podcast, and I'm recording this on Thursday night after Team USA defeated Serbia in one of my favorite basketball games of the year. It was a 95-91 victory highlighted by Steph Curry's 36-point night. Um, and lots to talk about in this one. I talked about this on the Garden Report with CLNS, so uh, you may have already heard me talk about this a little bit, but on the podcast, we're going to go a little bit deeper um, into what happened today from a Celtics perspective, and in particular, um, kind of thinking through what implications this whole Olympics experience is having for the Celtics roster down the road, potentially. Um, also going to touch on a couple other things. Um, Derek White, Drew Holiday, both have been key to this run. We're a little bit quieter against Serbia. Uh, Jason Tatum obviously gets another DNP, does not touch it, touch the court, does not check in um, against the same opponent, Serbia. So, Obviously, Steve Kerr has made that clear that he doesn't like that matchup, that Steve, uh, that Jason Tatum Serbia matchup for one reason or another. Um, and then we'll do just some, some quick off-season thoughts. Um, part of the difficult thing with starting this podcast in August is there's, there's things that I wish I'd gotten to talk about earlier in the summer that we'll be kind of slowly touching on throughout the summer. Um, and I've also been getting some questions about myself and my background and, and my journey. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, as always, you can subscribe to the You Got Boston podcast on all platforms. That includes YouTube, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, however you get your podcasts, you can subscribe to the You Got Boston podcast. Uh, like, subscribe, leave a five-star review. Uh, feel free to message me on Twitter if there's things you want to change. For example, many of you have messaged me about my background and the fact that you can see my shoes hanging on my door. That will change in September. I will be in a different living situation, so I will have a better place to podcast. So I apologize. Bear with me in the meantime. Um, but I, yeah, I'm glad and grateful for the fact that people are giving feedback, even if it's constructive feedback or whatnot. Feel free to continue reaching out. Um, lots of ideas for guests that people have suggested. So uh, we'll be continuing to kind of line those up. Uh, so far, these have all been solo pods, but we'll start having guests after the Olympic run ends. Um, when we do have a lot less to talk about, because right now there is a whole lot of news. This is not a typical August. Um, so I'll just start off with a little bit of an introduction on myself, just because some people have, are, are, I know are new listeners. And so I figured because this is episode four of the podcast, um, I would give a little bit of context of myself before we get into uh, the Celtics and Team USA and everything that we saw today. Um, so I started covering the Celtics about a year ago. It was actually like 13 months ago that I got the acceptance uh, email to write at Celtics blog, uh, which was totally just a passion project. At the time, I was a full-time lobbyist uh, covering uh, lobbying on sustainable foods and specifically on alternative proteins. Um, so if anyone's ever interested in talking about that, it's something that I'm, I'm still very passionate about. Um, and that's what I was doing full-time. And I always had loved basketball. I uh, did a lot of journalism in high school, a little bit in college, but it wasn't going to be my career path. Um, and then I started blogging a Celtics blog and I didn't realize that that came with credentials to sometimes going to games, but it did. So then it started being a couple of games and then it started being a hundred games. I went to literally every single game at one point, it felt like I uh, started going to practices, to community events. Um, and so it kind of was one of those things where it felt like I was just going to be able to write a blog piece once a week. And then all of a sudden the access and opportunities were there and I was kind of obsessed with it and I wanted to just take everything in. And so uh, put in the second that my workday would end, it, my new workday started and that was the Celtics workday. So uh, that was a lot of fun. Obviously covering Banner 18 was a lot of fun. Um, I grew up playing basketball, so I love the sport. I still play basketball recreationally. Um, not that good. I, I am obsessed with it though. I always have been uh, play a shooting guard. I always, um, my NBA comp I've said is Max Schroes in the sense that I'm a shooter, but I'm not that good of a shooter. Like I'm kind of like not, I'm not fulfilling that role effectively. And I feel like sometimes no hate to Max Struess. He sometimes is that shooter that is not uh, the most effective necessarily. So I think for me, it was kind of, I, I figured out that covering the Celtics and, and writing about the NBA was at the intersection of everything that I loved and cared about. And that's talking to people, getting to know people, building relationships, which obviously is a huge part of journalism, uh, basketball, which has been, like fundamental to my identity and everything that always made me happy growing up um, and then writing and talking. 
Um, and so I kind of realized uh, throughout the last season that this was a perfect intersection of everything that I enjoyed from both my personal interests for to the kind of the emotional human side of it as well. Um, and it certainly didn't hurt that last year's run was so fun. Um, so as of two weeks ago, I'm doing this full time covering the WNBA for SB Nation. Um, if you're curious about the WNBA, even if you're not a long time watcher, I think a lot of people are kind of new to the game. This is the time to tune in after the Olympics. There's not basketball until the fall, um, except there is the WNBA and it's going to be the home run of the season, you know, the home stretch of the season, excuse me, and then the playoffs. And so that's what I do now. I do that at SB Nation. And then I'm also a reporter covering the Celtics for CLNS and continuing my Celtics blog writing. Um, so don't mean to bore you all, but I do figure that if there are going to be repeat listeners, which I hope there are, um, a little bit of extra context on myself might help. Um, and I, again, like this is a learning, a learning process. I uh, uh, think something that I, I hopefully will grow with this podcast and very much open to feedback. One thing I've gotten quite a bit is to talk more slowly, which is making me realize, I think right now I've been talking quickly, but I will be doing that. I will be slowing down um, once a week, every Sunday, I think this is my intention right now. I'll be going live for a Sunday mailbag. So if you want to get your questions answered right now, I can just do chat questions, but I'm hoping to down the road to be able to actually have like callers um, and people actually be on the screen and, and kind of podcasting with me. So uh, that's in the works, hopefully down the stretch. Um, but for now, I think everybody wants to know about this, this Olympic situation um, and this Team USA win against Serbia and A was a really good one. If you did not watch this game in full length, I recommend you watch it. I know it's hard to do that sometimes when you already know the outcome of a game, but this is one of those games. It, it, it's worth it. It's worth it to sit down and watch it and grab some popcorn, even though you know it's going to happen because I feel like we watched multiple players that are, are going to go down as all-time greats kind of I don't want to say cement their legacies because their legacies are already cemented, um, but it's kind of maybe punctuate those legacies even further. So Steph Curry obviously was the hero tonight, uh, 36 points for him on 12 of 19 shooting, eight rebounds, two assists. He was a plus 20 in a game that they won by four. So that kind of tells you what you need to know about his impact in this one. And then LeBron James quietly had a triple double, 16 points, 12 rebounds, 10 assists. He was huge down the stretch, really kind of ignited that team. Uh, Kevin Durant only had nine points, but he had several key baskets in the closing minutes that kind of helped keep Serbia at bay. Um, and then the other player that I don't think Celtics fans are going to love to heap praise on, but Joel Embiid, monster tonight, 19 points, 8 of 11 shooting. Um, I, it doesn't change the fact that I don't think he was good earlier in these Olympic games, um, but I do think that in this particular matchup against Jokic, it's a big part of why USA basketball wanted to all beat on the roster. They got him and he was highly, highly impactful in this game offensively, defensively. He was just a, a, a good body to throw at Jokic. Obviously Jokic is going to do his thing. And I do think that Jokic exploited the fact that he was often doubled. Um, and so that was, uh, I thought defensively, not the scheme that they probably should have gone with, but they got away with it in this one, largely thanks to the individual greatness of a handful of players that I mentioned um, and the other guys, the ones that kind of the, have been the the fringe, maybe role players, the stars that are playing a smaller role, they struggled in this one. Anthony Edwards, just two points in 13 minutes. He came in, immediately turned the ball over on two consecutive plays. Uh, didn't look like the Anthony Edwards that has that like swagger and, and you know, offensive explosion that we had, we've seen for most of this tournament. Um Devin Booker was also quieter in this one. He finished with six points, but he hit a massive three with a couple minutes to go uh, that, that really helped them, you know, cut out the lead. And so he ended up being big. Um, Drew Holiday, Derek White, I thought were both quieter in this game. Um, Derek White had a couple of uncharacteristic plays. That's two games in a row now versus Brazil to the second and third quarter. He fouled right at the end of the quarters, which are just like not the kind of plays that he's usually make. Usually you can count on him to not make those kinds of plays. And then obviously in this particular game, he had the four-point play. He only played six minutes when scoreless 0 for 2 from the field. So he was a minus 16, which I think was the worst of any player on the team. Um, so again, it, it's six minutes. You, you can't take too much from that. But he definitely struggled in this one more so than he has in this Olympic run, which I thought he's been brilliantly impactful. Um, so that's just the high level. I think on, on when you're looking at it more granularly, it was pretty amazing to watch USA be down 15, 17. Um, every time it felt like they were going to cut at the lead and come back and tie things up, 
Serbia had another run in them. And it, the reality is, is that it wasn't just Jokic. Jokic was good. He finished with, uh, what did he finish with? 17 points and 11 assists. And I do think that them doubling him was a mistake because oftentimes he found teammates for wide open shots, wide open layups. Uh, Bogdan Bogdanovic was uh, really kind of going back and forth with Carmelo Anthony, who was sitting courtside. Um, he finished with 20 points. He was a huge reason why they were in it for a long time. And then I'm going to probably mess up the pronunciation, but Alexa Avramovich, who Noah Eagle was on the broadcast, did a phenomenal job, never messed up his name. So I, I got to get better at that. But he had 15 points and he was just, he was great. And he was great last year in the World Cup as well. So I remembered him from uh, that Serbia team that got silver. So again, I think this game you saw, individual greatness to kind of overcome uh, maybe team issues. And the team issues were rebounding for a lack of defensive intensity out the jump, which I always think, again, like I never play basketball at the level that these people are playing in, obviously, but I always find it remarkable that players that you can have a lack of like defensive intensity to start a, a semifinals Olympic game. Like, obviously this is a huge moment. Nobody wants to come out flat, but USA came out a little bit flat. Serbia got too comfortable. And once people start to see the ball going through the hoop for, for, you know, on easier shots, now those difficult shots become easy. And when you got a lot of good shooters, which the Serbia team does have, um, they were in a, in a dangerous position there for a moment there. So I think the main thing that I took away from this game is that this team's, you know, team issues and whether that's the coaching staff or it's the fact that this roster was assembled with too much star power, not enough guys that can do the little things, whatever it is, we might not ever see the consequences of those issues because the individual greatness is that enormous. Um, so it might not matter that the rotations I thought weren't great today. It might not matter that uh, this roster maybe has too many ball dominant players and not enough players that can be prolific rebounders. Um, though I don't think the rebounding based on a roster composition should be as, as up and down as it's been. Um, because what we saw from Steph Curry today and what we saw from LeBron multiple times and Kevin Durant throughout this tournament there's no way to overcome it. I mean, Serbia played a just remarkable game. I think Steve Kerr called it a perfect game after. Um, he said that it was an honor to be a part of it. So um, you're seeing guys just recognize that I don't know that Serbia could have done a whole lot more than what they did. And obviously it wasn't enough. They fell by four um, down the stretch. They had a couple opportunities, open looks. Uh, they just didn't fall. And that's, that's what happens when you are in a basketball game against some of the sports all-time greatest players is that you have to literally be perfect all the way down to the buzzer. And, you know, they made some mistakes, some missed shots down the stretch and um, it cost them. So that's kind of my general synopsis in this game. I think it was a, a kind of testament to the, the caliber of, of players you have on this roster. And next up we'll see Serbia, uh, sorry, USA versus France for the gold medal. And then Serbia and Germany competing for the bronze medal. Um, and both of those games should be great. Uh, I think the fact that France, you are playing effectively an away game on the road is is an added wrinkle here because obviously France is the host country and they, they've advanced, I think, to much of the surprise of a lot of people, they've advanced to the gold medal game and not necessarily because of the NBA players on the team. You know, I think it's it's Yabu, it's some of the European players that have just been playing out of their mind. Um, Rudy Gobert hasn't even been playing. He played a combined four minutes these last two games. So it's interesting how in international basketball, things change. The hierarchy of things change. Um, guys that are the four-time defensive players of the year, sometimes they maybe are not the right matchup. Uh, I've mentioned Jamal Murray a number of times, but I think he's a great example because he's somebody that I think in last year's playoff run was putting together a historically good playoff run and was effectively not helping Canada during their playoff, you know, during their Olympic run that was cut short without even the chance to medal. So um so yeah, both of those should be good games. I'll have Garden Report coverage discussing both those games. And then we'll be talking on You Got Boston, uh, diving a little bit deeper into kind of what went down and what my takeaways are. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about Jason Tatum too. Um, we'll do that. We're going to do a quick ad break and then I'll talk a little bit about Tatum and, and kind of what the takeaways are for the Celtics team. Because obviously a DNP, two DNPs is not what people were expecting uh, when this Olympic team was being assembled and when everybody arrived to training camp. So it's something that I, I don't want to put too much into because I do feel like it's been a little beaten to the ground. Um, but now that it's two games, it's a little bit more than just a blip of one time thing that he has experienced. Um, I want to weigh in and kind of what my thoughts and perspectives are at this point. So quick break before that. 
I love going to MLB games during the summer, love going to concerts, games, sporting events, and there's no better way to get tickets to all of those events than the Game Time app. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets the first pitch. You can download the Game Time app, you can see any event that you search, you can put the location in where you're based, see upcoming concerts, sporting events, whatnot, and get the best deals, best prices guaranteed. So. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code CLNS for twenty dollars off your first purchase. On top of the fact that it's already a really good deal, download the app. Terms apply. Redeem the code CLNS for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over five million active members. PrizePix is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps, on PrizePix, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Get on on the daily action with your friends and become part of the PrizePix community today. You can now win up to 100 times your money on PrizePix with as little as four correct picks. With PrizePix, you could turn $10 into $1,000 while watching Team USA rack up the gold medal this summer. You can make a prize picks lineup of players across basketball, soccer, tennis, golf, and more in as little as 60 seconds. Just pick more or less on two to six player stat productions and you're locked in. So personally, I'm excited to watch uh, Team USA compete in these next few games. So download the prize picks app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit matchup to $100. That's code CLNS on prize picks for a deposit matchup to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. So let's talk a little bit about the Celtics implications of this Olympic run, um, because I, I think the, one of the fascinating things that's happened here is that this could actually be good for the Celtics. And what I'm referring to is the fact that they did not have the relish in the championship, enjoy the moment and appreciate the fact that you won type of summer. And that's the type of summer that normally players have after they win their first championship or any championship is you get to post all the photos and videos from it all summer. You get to, be heaped with praise and probably don't pick up a basketball for a few months. And then you come back. And a lot of times the teams that come back don't look as good as the other teams in their conference. And they usually take a step back, at least in the beginning, we call it the championship hangover, whatever you want to call it. Maybe it's the extra miles from playing all the way through June, um, but it's really hard to repeat. And that's why the last team a team repeated was the Kevin Durant Warriors 2017, 2018. Since then we've seen a completely different team every single year win the championship. And so initially when we were having conversations around, like, is this Celtics team going to repeat? Um, I was kind of saying, I don't really think so, just because statistically it's unlikely. It's hard enough to win one time that it, winning twice is that much harder. Um, and I don't, you know, I if I had to bet on it, I, I don't know what I would necessarily say at this point because there's kind of things pointing to both directions. But I have to, I've had this kind of thought over these last few weeks that I actually think everything that's going on with the Olympics is going to really benefit the Celtics team. And maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe it'll backfire altogether. But my perspective on this is as follows. So you have Jalen Brown, who's obviously really scorned by the fact that he wasn't on Team USA. He has talked about this extensively on Twitter, tweeted like the emojis. He's tweeted like at Nike. Um, we got to talk to him at Summer League when he was courtside at a Lakers Celtics game. And at Summer League, he pretty much said, there's more to come. There's more to follow. Um, nothing between me and Derek, but I know that Nike had to do with why I wasn't named to the roster. So everybody knows that saga. I don't need to rehash it. Um, but obviously, Jalen Brown is feeling a little bit, a little bit antagonized going into the summer. And I do think that that's going to be an impact on him and influence on him heading into next year. Um, and he's the guy that we know he gets fueled by being rejected, by being, you know, overlooked. He's gotten better every single year in his career. There are a few players that have that improved trajectory the way that he does, where literally every year you got better than the year before. Um, and I think this whole USA fiasco is going to be good for him on the court in the long term. Maybe it won't be good for his marketability or his, at, you know, his future earnings. I'm not sure. But I do think that from a basketball standpoint, he's feeling extra motivated. He's not feeling like, I'm on top of the world. I got my finals MVP. Why didn't I take a summer to relax? Um, and I don't know, maybe Jalen Brown is not the kind of guy that would be able to relax and not play basketball for a summer anyways. So maybe this is all besides the point. 
But we did kind of have this whole saga with him that made it so that the championship and the parade and all that lasted for like two weeks of peace. And then this whole thing started, right? This whole thing started when Derek White was named as Kawhi Leonard's replacement. So we have that. Then we have Jason Tatum, who was a, one of the most important players on the 2021 team, um, already an Olympic gold medalist and almost a non-factor for this team. And I don't want to say a non-factor altogether because we know that every guy in a locker room matters. Um, we know that he has played at times. It's not like he's been a zero minutes per game player, um, but he's been one of the guys that's been the least impactful, uh, the least, uh, you know, the least featured in the offense. Um, he's now has two DNPs and I believe out of, I believe five Olympic games, both of the Serbia games, he literally has not checked in and it's not what anybody expected. Everybody thought that he was going to be a, a, a mainstay of his roster. It was a question of, was he going to be a starter? Was he going to be kind of the guy running the second unit? I don't think anybody expected that this could happen where he was like the odd man out with Tyrese Halliburton. Um, and Halliburton's in a different story. You know, he's a first, a first time Olympian. I think he's just happy to be here, happy to be on the roster. He made the team over a guy like Jalen Brunson from FIBA last year. So I don't think he has any complaints or really a lot of, a lot of attention on the fact he's not playing, but Jason Tatum, I think the hardest part for him is probably like not even just the not playing, but the discourse around it. You know, everybody's weighing in. All these former and current players are weighing in. Draymond Green basically ripped Steve Kerr on his podcast, talked about how it's why it's disrespectful. How could it be that Jason Tatum's not playing? Um, it's one of the things that I've seen the most like me national media analysts talk about. Um, and so, yeah, it became a huge story. And it's kind of the story of Jason Tatum's summer, more so than the championship glow. Um, and there's two ways that that can go. On one hand, maybe this makes him think winning a championship didn't solve all my problems. And it didn't give me the, the high that I was hoping for because I still spent the summer being criticized and scrutinized and all that. On the other hand, he might just feel disrespected by this whole Team USA experience because people have been, have been coming to bat for him and they have been coming to his defense. Um, and in that case, you're really talking about he's going to come back to Boston feeling so re-energized, so refreshed, and basically thinking to himself, like I was disrespected by a coaching staff that was comprised of like the Warriors coach, the Miami coach, the Clippers coach. So it's not even just one guy, but it's like the entire organization. I was outcast as the guy that doesn't get minutes. And I want to go show the world now, like who I am and who my team is. Um, and maybe him and Jalen Brown have a bonding moment over and maybe not, you know, I don't want to speculate too much here. But there is a chance that he comes back with his chip on his shoulder that you don't normally have after you win a championship um, because of the fact that he's had to deal with the DNPs and the discourse and people making fun of his celebrations. And, you know, he just has to have like the most just enjoy your summer and without any controversy, the way that, for example, we saw with like a Giannis or a Jokic when they won their first championship. I think they got to enjoy that bliss a little bit more. Um, so there is a world where Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum both come back with something to prove. Um, Peyton Pritchard was on the Point Forward podcast this week uh, talking to Evan Turner. And Evan Turner asked him a couple things. I thought it was a great listen, a great interview, a great conversation between two guys that are obviously good friends. Um, so check that episode out if you want to hear it full. But Peyton Pritchard basically talked about how, A, he completely understood why Jalen Brown was removed or was, was frustrated at not being considered for that last Olympic spot. Um, one of the things that I really liked that he said uh, and I'm going to try to find this quote because I, I really appreciate the fact that Peyton Pritchard actually called this out. Um, it was, he, he basically said that people have a misconception about Jalen Brown and they have a misconception on who he is. He said he can defend, he can play any role. And I think Jalen would accept that people sometimes have this version of him that he's this difficult teammate or difficult dude, which is not the case at all. Um, so, and I've, I'm guilty of this. Like I've totally said, I think, USA basketball didn't think that Jalen Brown was going to be okay with being a DNP uh, in an Olympic game or being like not featured in the offense. And Derek White, meanwhile, everybody knows he's a good attitude. He's happy go lucky. He can come in and whatever his minutes are, he'll be supportive and he'll be happy to be there. So I think that's a common understanding about Jalen Brown. Um, and the reality is, is that for, as media, like I do my best to try to ask questions and try to watch as much as I can with my own eyes and be everywhere that I can be. I wish I was in Paris covering this in person, but I still just get a slice of the pie. Um, I don't get the full story. And Peyton Pritchard is his teammate and he's been his teammate for his entire career as a professional. And the reality is that Peyton Pritchard is telling us this is not a guy that's like difficult to be 
a teammate. This is not a guy that's difficult that has to have a particular role. And when you think about it, we kind of know that because he's not been the most featured player. At times, we know I've seen Tatum take a, so many game winners where Jalen Brown had it going and he didn't even get a touch in the last few minutes. And Jalen Brown has accepted those things. And so I do think he, he that there's a, a piece here where Peyton Pritchard was both defending Jalen Brown on that side and also was saying, you know, Tatum's going to get fired up from this. Um, the fact that he's getting in DNPs, obviously such a, such a talented player. Um, he's going to go out next year and really show them um, that there might be this kind of sense of unity when the team reconvenes of like, listen, I know we all did our own thing over the summer. Some people may have felt scorned. Some people may have felt like they went and weren't appreciated. But now we're back in this system under Joe Mazzulla, a coach that clearly believes in all these guys um, with the exact same roster that you had last year with a formula that's proven. Like you can prove this roster, this works, right? You can win a championship with this combination of players and with the principles and calls that were made last year. And so you almost have the opportunity to like just run it back and, and kind of be, do it like as like a palate cleanser, regardless of what happens here. I was thinking at a point during this game against Serbia, um, where it looked like USA was going to lose, I was thinking to myself, like, I wonder what everybody's thinking right now. Obviously, for some guys, this is like, you know, like a Steph Curry was just looking to be an Olympian and that's devastating for him. You know, who else, who knows what else he's going to be able to compete for in his career. Um, and I was thinking about what Jalen Brown's thinking. You know, is he sitting at home watching this? I don't know. He's been doing a lot this offseason. Maybe he's nowhere near TV and doesn't even know that they're playing today. Um, and then I was thinking about it from Jason Tatum's perspective that I'm sure there's going to be some feeling of like just being happy to be back with the Celtics, just given the fact that he is so appreciated and he's featured and he knows his role and he has the whole city behind him. And I think even more so like Celtics fans right now, they love Tatum as much as any, as much as ever, because they're so freaking out about the fact that he's not playing. Like as much as it sucks, I'm sure he's seeing all the backlash too. And it has to feel good to be defended in some sense. So there's a lot going on here. I think that a lot of this is speculation and, and generally my podcast, you know, you got Boston will not be centered around speculation. It'll be more things that I saw, heard, you know, experience behind the scenes. Obviously right now I'm in Boston, I'm not in Paris. So I don't have the same vantage, you know, that vantage point and view that I'll, I'll normally have during the season. And I actually will be on the road a lot during the season. So I will be able to kind of have a, a good on the ground perspective. Um, but right now, you know, I'm just kind of giving my two cents in this whole thing. I think this actually might benefit the Celtics in the long run. Um, the fact that players are, are feeling maybe uncertain or fired up or motivated or teammates are, are egging each other on. The fact that Peyton Pritchard is saying, I want to see Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, like come out next year and show people um, that could all end up being good. So right now, obviously we're watching the Olympics. Uh, this is super fun to watch for me. I love watching basketball. So the fact that we get to watch, Free extra basketball is amazing. The fact that we get to watch Jokic and Embiid battle on August 8th, you know, I feel just so we're so lucky as basketball fans to have so many different things to watch and so many high high profile games to tune into um, and just individual greatness, regardless of who, which players you like watching outside of the Celtics. You know, Steph Curry is a player that I grew up loving um, as a three-point shooter. My dad was a professional basketball player. He's also a three-point shooter. Steph Curry to me was like the you know, the holy grail of three-point shooting. And so getting to watch him do his thing at his age on the international level, like it's so much fun. But regardless of where you're coming at this from, hopefully you're able to enjoy this Olympic experience. And if you're not, because you're all, you know, you're pissed off that Tatum's not playing, um, at least appreciate the fact that you're just a couple months removed from a championship because some fans have been waiting their whole lives for this moment. And I hope the Celtics fans aren't letting it go by too quickly um, because I do think that, it's worth rewatching games and it's worth rehashing storylines and thinking back about favorite moments and things. Um, and so for me, this has been an incredibly enjoy enjoy enjoyable Olympic experience is just getting to watch so much basketball, both on the men's and women's side. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited to get back into the swing of the season. Um, I believe training camp is going to start in late September, early October, and I'll be there every day covering practices, covering um, everything that we hear, pressers, media availabilities. So uh, do subscribe, do like, comment. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. It's at Noah Dalzell. Uh, give me a follow if you don't already. Feel free to DM me if you have questions or suggestions about how you want this podcast done. Um, right now it is kind of in a different process, as I said, because I'm not actually at the places where I'm covering things, um, but still wanted to give you all, to jump on here and give you all a little bit more context about myself, a little bit more context about myself as a person and as a kind of how I got involved in all of this. Um, and then also give you my thoughts on 
this Olympic experience from a Celtics lens and how I think ultimately this could end up benefiting the team, not just because you have guys come, coming back hungry, but also I think someone like Joe Missoula is probably reading books all summer about uh, what it takes to, to, you know, go back to back to three peat um, what pitfalls there are. I don't think he's just out here relishing in the fact that they've won and enjoying that. I think everybody in the Celtics organization has been made very clear to me from my time at summer league, talking to people, uh, this is an organization that's ready to, you know, get right back with it and and pursue another championship. So I think we're going to see excellence from the jump. But honestly, the more this Olympic thing starts to become confusing, up and down, disrespectful, whatever you want, however you want to term it, um, I think it's only going to benefit the Celtics even more. So with that short episode today, because we, I did talk about this in the Garden Report as well, so I don't want to, if there's mutual, you know, if there's overlapping listeners, I don't want to talk about it too much, but uh, feel free to check that out if you haven't. We do a post-game show on CLNS after every Olympic game and after every Celtics game as well. Um, but with that, thanks so much for tuning in. Again, You Got Boston. You can find it on my YouTube channel, You Got Boston, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and do feel free to reach out. I appreciate all the support. appreciate all the kind comments about um, enjoying our discussions. Um, and yeah, it keeps me going. It keeps me motivated to keep producing content and, and sharing ideas with all of you. Um, and I will be back recapping this game live on Sunday. So I'll do a, a live Q&A on Sunday where I will talk about um, what went down and, and kind of uh, a day removed from the gold medal game from a Celtics lens. I'll be answering other questions. So you can, if you have questions right now, as I've been talking that you want to ask, feel free to jump on live. All you have to do is put those questions in the chat and I pretty much answer every single question and I'll go a little bit longer for the live version. So about 45 minutes. Uh, with that, thanks so much everybody for your time and I hope you have a great rest of your week.